Welcome to The In Chamber, the place where we focus on the issues and people that shape business success. I'm your co-host, Rebecca Patrick. I'm the Senior Vice President of Communications for the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. Joining me at the microphone is Anthony Shutley, our Director of Communications. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. Work-based learning can have a transformative role in preparing Hoosiers for success in a rapidly changing economy and helping businesses grow their own talent. Today, we are chatting with Carrie Lively, Executive Director at the Pursuit Institute in Hamilton County, formerly the Hamilton County Center for Career Achievement. It's the conduit between public schools and businesses for work-based learning opportunities in the area. Carrie, thank you for talking with us today. Thank you. You come to the work-based learning effort from a variety of angles through your background as a teacher, administrator, and state agency official. Tell our listeners about your work leading up to your current role at the Pursuit Institute. So being a former school counselor, school teacher, and school administrator, I understand the educational side of uh, workforce development and uh, being able to have worked at the state level and engaging public-private partnership together in uh, the role of uh, creating workforce pipelines has really been unique in my setting. And and that's been a skill that, that we're trying to to expand and scale across the state and one that is is proving to be beneficial in Hamilton County. So the opportunity to be able to um, experience the challenges both in the K-12 setting as well in the workforce development setting and kind of um, streamline those those challenges together and and meet the needs on both ends has been um, exciting and and game-changing for me. Well, how would you characterize where Indiana is overall right now with WorkBase? learning opportunities. I know there are pockets that maybe some similar activity maybe to what's going on in Hamilton County is going on and other areas where there may be nothing going on, but what, what, how would you characterize it? As you referenced, there are pockets of greatness that are happening all across Indiana. Um, the environment is is ripe. It's prime for for work based learning to happen. Um, as a state, we've we've laid this foundation. Um, and the expectation has been set that that education um, is transform is transforming, and then and we're engaging in different ways than we have historically. Um, the interesting thing is that this isn't just unique to Indiana. We're learning from states around us. We're learning from across the country um, how we can connect education and industry together. So this this concept has been proven, and it's a benefit um, to expand those pr- public private partnerships and. Um, you know, experience education and training together. And in Indiana, I think we've doubled down from you know, an education perspective, um, a, a a workforce development perspective, and, and we're moving in the direction of being able to um, provide equitable access to programs. And that's that's important because we have pockets of success. We have pockets of greatness happening. But all students, all Hoosier students should have access to these uh, transforming opportunities of, of learning about the world of work before they actually leave high school. And, and they're able to make better informed decisions about what path their future is going to hold. Definitely. Last month, you were a participant in our uh, BizVoice roundtable on work, work-based learning. You said something during that that really sort of uh, stayed with me. It was that most educators simply don't understand workforce development. They don't know or embrace their role in preparing students for the workforce. Expand on that. And how do we begin to change that mindset? They're trained to be specialists in education, uh, curriculum, instruction, classroom management, communication. They're trained to do that job. And they're not trained to be workforce development specialists. And so across all aspects of formal education preparation programs, we're teaching teachers how to teach. We're teaching counselors how to counsel. We're teaching administrators how to run buildings and, and districts. We're not embedding what it means to engage in workforce formally for our educators, but we're expecting them to be able to do this at a high level of proficiency without a lot of support. So it, it, it's not that teachers aren't interested or willing or wanting to learn. I think foundationally, we have we have expectations on our teachers that are almost out of reach. I mean, it would be like me asking my accountant to run and develop a marketing campaign. 
I mean, they're not trained to do that. How can I expect them to do that and do that proficiently? So I think if if this is if this is a shift that we're moving in Indiana and, and we're, you know, we're really identifying that that work-based learning and engaging with um, you know, programs of study and, and engaging with industry is important and that's that's a solution to our workforce needs, then we need to help prepare our educators to be able to do that job. It's we can't continue to add things to their plate and expect them to do everything amazing. Carrie, as I understand it, the Pursuit Institute is the intermediary facilitating work-based learning opportunities uh, for the six public high schools in Hamilton County. I know Rebecca is going to get into a little more specific initiatives a little later, but let's start off with what that means, uh, essentially, and, and what the organization does. Sure. So the Pursuit Institute was an initiative of the Hamilton County Council and Hamilton County Commissioners. And uh, with, along with the six school superintendents, they decided that we needed to do something different for our students in Hamilton County. Um, like other parts of the state, um, students in Hamilton County uh, were sent outside of, of the, the county to attend a career and technical education center. Um, and that CTE district uh, where students went to could serve about 2% of our student population. So about 300-ish students were able to attend um, that career center. And that career center offered phenomenal programming. I mean, it, it, it's state of the art programming and, and, and out of this, out of this world opportunities for students, but it's only 300 students. And so our, our local leaders decided that we needed to try and do something different so that we could provide opportunities for all students to engage in workforce before they leave high school. And so the Pursuit Institute was an initiative that's not only an educational initiative, but it's grounded in workforce development and economic development. We want students to be able to engage throughout their K-12 experience with multiple employers, uh, whether that is through a, a continuum of work-based learning activities, um, and, and be able to make more informed post-secondary decisions on what they wanna do. If that's going on to a four-year institution, we want them to know five to seven businesses that they can come back to Hamilton County and be employed at because they've had that experience through high school. If that's going into the world of work, we want those connections to be made for those students to be able to, to fill those jobs um, with the companies that they've, they've already had an experience with. So we see this as a way to, to keep people in Hamilton County to to, to grow, uh, live, work, and play in Hamilton County, as well as um, a, a business attraction um, component where we have pipelines of, of skilled individuals ready to fill those jobs. It sounds like it's as much about retaining the brain power, kind of a drain gain, as opposed to a drain, uh, brain drain, uh, as much as anything. I mean, is that a big part of it, keeping the talent at home? It is. It is. It's. It's. You know, Hamilton County. I, I'm a. I'm a native, so I, I. arguably could say it's. You know, it's the best place to live, and um, we we are are working hard to make sure that um, we have people in our county that that can fill the jobs that we have. I mean, that's a that's a national crisis that we have more job openings than job seekers, and so um, it, it's an active strategy to to keep people within the county and, and filling those those open positions. Carrie, you've touched on this a little bit uh, previously, but it, it seems like there's, I mean, at least among the people that we talk to, a near kind of unanimous consensus about this disconnect about the standards or competencies that are being taught from middle middle school onward uh, compared to the, you know, what the skills the employers need in the real world. And you've touched on that a little bit, but drill down just a little bit more and tell us what's already going on in that in that realm and how can the state schools and local employers do more? And how can that bridge be, uh, how can that divide be bridged, essentially? You know, I think that for a long time, education has been education and and work has been work or, you know, the workforce has been the workforce. And there's been very little, like, crossing of, of those two systems. And what we're seeing in Hamilton County and, and what we're seeing in other in other pockets of Indiana and, and across across the nation are... When employers become producers, active producers in the educational system, instead of just consumers of the product, we, we see those shifts change. So when we get employers at the table talking to kids about whatever, you know, accounting, I'll go back to accounting, talking to students about what accounting might be. And the business teacher is, is hearing that they're also learning. We have to think about our teachers and the way they're trained. They are trained 
to, to teach. And, you know, if you've been in, in the classroom for any, you know, 10 years, technology has changed and what the world of work looks like has changed. And so being able to um, connect with teachers, being able to connect with students um, increases the uh, relatability of what we're teaching our students because those skills are transferable into the classroom. So the more that we can um, overlap those two systems of education and workforce and, and have our um, our industry leaders helping guide what is being taught in classes and and, and what um, types of, of technology or what types of systems are being used in industry and, and making sure that students are are given those opportunities with, you know, the state of the art um, equipment, state of the art, you know, technology, then I will see that shift change. Um, I do think it's a relationship change. Uh, we have to um, engage where we haven't before and and um, where we see success is where those things are happening. When we come to these crisis points, I always wonder how we got here. And granted, it's been a minute since I was in middle school or high school back in the late 70s, early 80s. But I, I do remember there being some contact points between business people. And, and, and I came from a more blue collar area. So there was more emphasis on vocational training. Uh, I, I'm wondering how we got here. What What brought us to this crisis point? Is it an awareness? Is it the the brain gain, brain drain situation. How how did we get here? So I think uh, in in lots of things, there's been this this pendulum sh uh, shift in in how we approach education. Um, in the, the the mid to late nineties, uh, we, we saw this shift in um, you know the number of students that we were we were pushing on to college, and um, you know I remember in in my house. Um, there was never a question of, are you going to college? It was, what college are you going to? And it wasn't, honestly, until until a couple of years ago that I realized I was a first-generation college student. And, I mean, I'm, I'm an educator. I probably should have known that. Um, but that was that was never the conversation in my house, is, was if you wanted to go to college, it was just, oh, you're going to college, or otherwise you're going to end up in a dead end job. And that was kind of, um, I don't know if it was necessarily a, a fear tactic, um, but that's been kind of the, the, the mantra that we've pushed for, for decades that students need to go to college if they want to have a career. You can't get a good job if you don't have a degree. And, you know, part of that, I, I, there's some truth in, in continual learning. There's truth that you need to continually push yourself and learn uh, to grow. Um, but it's not the college for all mantra. And so I think we pushed so far one way, we're now trying to, to regain some of that and, and, and find back to, to the center. And um, it, it's it's a lot of, of remarketing what, what success looks like to parents that, you know, we don't have to send every student to college. And, you know, looking at not only celebrating the success, the college success rates, but also um, looking at the number of students who don't graduate uh, college in six years or the number of students who don't matriculate into their second year of college and use that as the point of now we figure out what we can do to better help this population. That, uh, you know, we we really celebrate the number of students we send. We don't figure out what happens. And we know there's a large percentage of students who don't end up with that degree. So I think if we start there with the population of students who don't have that degree and figure out how we can better prepare that population, then we'll see that shift overall. We have to change the way we talk to students. We have to change the way we talk to parents and we have to change the measure of success. Carrie, when you when you talk about bridging that gap, you 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 talk about relationships, and obviously you're in the relationship business, and you're you're the point person in a lot of those relationships. But you know, I guess what I get concerned about is uh, when you're talking about these types of things, is that you know these sorts of systems, if you will, are built on person A and person B at organization, you know, D and E, right? And so, how do you mm -hmm. build a system? where those relationships continue, even though personalities and persons vacate from time to time. So how do you, how do you build that system that accomplishes what you're trying to accomplish when people come and go or as people come and go? That, and that's, that's part of the problem. When we talk about um, the formality of, of building a system that connects school and industry, um, 
that's my niche. Uh, for the first time in my life, all of these things that I've done as an occupation, this is what I'm meant to do. And and that is kind of a humbling experience to to finally feel like this is this is what I'm meant to do. Um, but it was by trial and error that I I found my passion. Uh, this what this wasn't like a, a a degree program that I could have checked the box and say if you want to do this job here's how you get there. Um, so this was kind of a a trial and error of of where I found myself and and uh, you know what I felt my calling might be. But the the formality of the educational system and the workforce systems or the business um, and industry um, you know market itself has has to be connected and again i go back to the idea that we're asking teachers to to do things they're not trained to do and um if we had a foundation of teachers who understood the workforce development and their role in this placement of the system then it's not contingent upon one person it's not contingent upon you know an intermediary hoping to be there to make those connections we have to if we're expecting this to happen we have to we have to put the uh the parameters in place to make it successful one initiative at the pursuit institute that we spoke about last last month uh, during the round table um, I believe it's in the incubation stage and involves what you called explorer sites. Tell us more about that and what that exactly um, the objective is. So in my experience in education and, you know, when I when I first started as a school counselor. Um, there there are course codes that school counselors um, use to put students in certain experiences. So there are course codes that are associated with math, science, English, and uh, the Department of Education had a course code for work-based learning. And the course description for work-based learning was, you know, a student going out into a uh, the community and, and learning a job or learning about a job. And so um, for educators and for me as an educator, that was my association with work-based learning. Work-based learning was a student and an employer getting together at a location outside of the school, the school building. And as I've come to to learn, work-based learning is so much more than just that experience. Um, Work-based learning is this continuum of opportunities that should be built on top of each other so that students have multiple engagement points. And so what we're doing in, um, in Hamilton County is we are expanding we're developing out, maybe we'll come up with a better name than Explorer Sites, but essentially um, a directory of our business partners that want to engage with students and and, um, high schools and school districts and be able to kind of um, identify that level of engagement. So if a, a company wants to have five interns we can identify that level of engagement and have all of the information uh, for students, for parents, for school personnel to to know how to get involved with that. But if a company wants to Skype in and talk about what whatever it might be, widget making, then they can do that too. And that's a much lower lift or a lower expectation on a company, but that still getting them FaceTime with students, still getting them in front of kids and connected to the school. And maybe throughout time that, you know, uh, Skype in might become a job shadow or that might become um, a, a field trip site. But we want to give our community partners every opportunity to engage and then give our schools the resources to know how to engage with those business partners and having an intermediary as the pursuit institute facilitating all of that now you don't have six different school districts calling one company asking hey what can you do for us so we're trying to create this centralized hub that not only um expands access for everyone but also creates less work on our employers to engage Sounds like it's really designed to meet employers wherever they are in that con- mm-hmm. continuum, whether it's a, a light lift at first, hopefully it'll make grow to something later, or if they're ready to, you know, jump in, as you said, with, you know, a collection of app- apprentices or something. So, right. Great. Well, how have you, through your work at the Pursuit, how have you seen 
sort of students maybe options broaden, widen, and employers similarly feeling that this is a valuable practice to build their pipeline of workers? You know, when I took this job a year and a half ago, it uh, I, I didn't know what to expect, um, but I I went in with the idea of I'll work with the willing, and that's been awesome. But there's so many willing in in Hamilton County. Um, you know, we are we're looking at creating a a system that is, I mean, borderless. There, we're not building a building. We're not building a location for for students to to report to. Once you build a building, you reach capacity. So really, the focus is to utilize our community resources and allow our community partners to be active in that engage in that education process. Um, we're we're letting kids experience class in in places that that you know, can't be replicated in a four, a four wall classroom. When you teach environmental science in a, in a classroom with four walls, kids can learn a lot, but when you teach it on, on the the grounds of Connor Prairie and kids are, are seeing what pollutants do to the waters and what, what happens to the plant life and, and they're engaging with that. It's a whole different level of education. And, and then you add in employers to that mix that are coming in and coming to a central location where students are able to, um, to see what environmental science looks like across the spectrum and not just from one person's perspective. Um, it, it's, it's a game changer. And so we're, we're really um, banking on those, those, establish community resources and expanding those partnerships and helping to facilitate how we can connect students and and the community partners um, together in a, in a location that's that's accessible for everyone. Let's hone in a little bit more on the employer side. What feed okay. what have you heard once they engage in the work-based learning space? Once they engage in the work-based learning um, like continuum we're, we're kind of we're kind of on on two ends of the spectrum. Um, if we if we are preparing students for a job and we're giving them you know some some background skills, employability skills, or even you know a, a, an OSHA certification or um, you know a first aid certification or whatever that might be, if, if they're coming to the employer with some basic knowledge and and capabilities, that outcome is different than if we're asking an employer to be a part of a of a socially kind of out of social responsibility take on somebody the experiences of students are different as well so if we can if we can get information from the employers who are are able to tell us what skills they they're looking for and package a student with those capabilities the outcome and the return on that investment for the employer is much different than if we're giving them someone who it is just trying to figure out if they want to do the job. So it's not, again, that continuum of work-based learning is very different. And, um, you know, the the outcome of, of an employer and the return on that investment of the employer um, is contingent upon kind of what they're wanting and what they're getting. Now, a quick word about our sponsor. The Talent Resource Navigator is a new free online tool that offers the convenience of one-stop shopping for education and job training opportunities. Supported by on-demand customer service and technical assistance, the Navigator intentionally guides and connects individuals and employers with a tailored set of talent development resources based on each user's identified needs. Details at talentresourcenavigator.com. You know, we've talked a lot of um, broad perspective and, and some theory and different different things, but I wanted to get your personal thoughts uh, as as I listen to you speak. And, and obviously, you have a lot of passion for for what you're for what you're doing and what you're talking about. But why personally was uh, your current job? And you haven't been at it that long. Why was it appealing to you? What brought you as an educator to want to do what you're doing there? So. I mentioned I'm a, I'm a Hamilton County native and um, my passion has always been helping students find their passion, whether that was a, a teacher. Um, I taught English and it's hard to get kids passionate about English, um, but getting students passionate about learning um, and, and sparking, finding, finding something within them to, to light a fire. 
And as a school counselor, uh, you, you have a little bit more opportunity to do that um, if you have a manageable caseload. And then as an administrator, I, I realized that um, kind of from, from a systems level, like it wasn't necessarily built for innovation at that time. That was, you know, a hundred years ago. So um, getting into kind of this job now of, of connecting uh, work, workforce and education, it, I guess I'm weird. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that students should have opportunities and I feel like I am a product of the opportunities that were put in front of me. And if we don't give students opportunities then we're limiting kind of not only their future, but our future as well. And so I feel I feel really compelled to work outside of, of traditional expectations of, of, of what it means to be an educator and and really find opportunities for students and and it shouldn't it shouldn't be dependent upon your zip code as to what you have access to from an education perspective. And, and that is, is something that I'm, I'm very passionate about. Um, my daughter, I mean, she has this weird mom who who loves to, you know, make make connections. You know, we were talking about what, what she wanted to be when she was, was super little. And, um, you know, we have, she has been able to experience things that other kids have not. And, and that's not fair. All kids should have the opportunity to experience and engage and explore uh, the world of work. And, and that's really kind of my calling is, is if I can make an impact in my local community and that can be scaled and replicated across Indiana or across the, the country, then we're giving kids opportunities that weren't there before. You've shared off microphone that you have three teenage daughters, which I think is pretty yeah. brave. Um, <laughs> have you um, learned anything from them and from raising them that you bring to work? Oh man, I, you know, I have, I've, I, I, I have learned that, you know, my perception of, of how we, how we talk to students about careers and about, you know, academics and then what do you, what do you want to do um, after high school um, from a parent is very different than the perception that I have as an educator of working on the outside. Um, you know, when I talk to, to um, my daughters about, you know, high school graduation, requirements. They don't even know. They're like, I don't know. I'll just, I'll just figure it out. And, um, you know, for people on the outside, we think that it's very regimented and, and you have to do ABC to get to D and, um, you know, students don't necessarily feel that pressure, but they also kind of are like just wandering in space. Um, I've become kind of this like local celebrity with my daughter's friends who all think that I'm now their personal career counselor. And so uh, they want to talk about, you know, what they want to do and, hey, can you help me get connected to, to, to this, um, you know, this industry? And, you know, I think that when kids have an idea of, you know, that there's there's an opportunity or there, there there's not limits that they start to think outside the box, too. But it's it's interesting with with my three girls and, and how very different they are and, um, you know, the pressure that that we think that they feel of, of being like pigeonholed into a, a pathway it is not, is not reality. What, what specific, we've talked a lot about broad perspectives with your job. So what specific successes mm -hmm. or other examples can you share where progress is being made either in Hamilton County or beyond? Sure. So, I mean, I, I mentioned kind of my daughter's um, friends coming over and, and talking about, you know, what they want to be. Um, you know, a kid doesn't really know what they want to be unless they're exposed to that um you know in 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 education we do and especially k-12 education we do the best we can of of kind of creating these 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 career clusters and and exposure to to broad careers in in let's say healthcare um and and we've built a system where students can um you know get a cna certification and and work in healthcare and that certification is awesome because they can go and they can work and they can decide what they want to do and, and still have an income to be able to, to offset the cost of, of life. Um, but what we've done in, in Hamilton County is we've built that CNA certification and, and a CNA is, is um, an individual working in a long-term healthcare facility. 
and um, high school students who think that they want to go into the medical field, they see a very limited scope of what the medical field looks like as their experience of a CNA. They may get to interact with an LPN or an RN or maybe an occupational therapist, but but those interactions with other healthcare professionals are, are pretty limited. So what we've done in Hamilton County is, is we've created that, that CNA, but the next step is students get a phlebotomy certification. So now they have two certifications that are stacked upon each other that both have currency across the state, across the nation. They can take those certifications and go work anywhere. But that phlebotomy certification is a, is a door into our county hospital. And so students are hired as phlebotomy technicians, but they are are put in, in rotations as a phlebotomy technician in, um, you know, the search tech area, in, in the lab, in family practice, in the ER. So they're not only seeing and, and, and working as a search tech in a multitude of environments, but they're also being mentored and engaging with a multitude of individuals that have lots of different careers in the healthcare field. So the goal now is that we have kids who who thought they wanted to go into nursing. And we, we either reinforced that or we've identified maybe another healthcare position or other healthcare pathway to go into, or we've let them know that healthcare is not their thing and they, they can they can choose something else, but they have um, employability skills. They have you know some money in their pocket and they have some credentials where they can continue to, to work while they figure that out. It occurs to me how fortunate your, um, your daughters and your daughter's friends are to have you as a resource. And I mean that sincerely. And you are obviously a, a, a resource both formally and, and more informally at home. I think back to my days at Southport High School and Indiana University, and I think the resource was basically a bulletin board. Opportunities were posted on the bulletin board, and it was up to you to go find them, right? So I'm, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. on, a, on a broader scale now, how can we do a better job of helping identify local resources that can assist uh, students and assist, assist employers in making things happen? Yeah, that's that's the key. There has to be there has to be someone, something dedicated to that. Um, you know, even when I was a school counselor, it was hard. It was hard to find. Like I remember trying to make a book of of like mental health resources. I mean, again, that was a that was a hundred years ago. But trying to find a, a book of of if I have a student or if I have a family who who is experiencing a um, you know a financial crisis, where can I help? send them to. And, you know, back in the day, the, it was hard to be able to know what was in your community, do your job, and then be able to make those connections with the people in the community and, and the students and, and, and be that conduit. So there has to be someone or something that is 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 based and, and its purpose is to bring those people together or those entities together. And I think that that's the, the foresight of what we had with, in Hamilton County with, with our, our local um, officials. I mean, they, they invested in this, they invested in the Pursuit Institute and um, it was, it was a big financial commitment, uh, economic development and, and Hamilton County tourism committed to incubating this idea and seeing it to fruition. But it really was a community initiative that, everyone was on board. I mean, think of those six schools in Hamilton County, which are arguably, you know, the best six schools in the state of Indiana. And for years, those six schools are competing against each other for students and for accolades and, you know, who's the best in the top of the top. We're now collaborating. We're now sharing programs from one school district to the other. We're working together on grant applications to share resources. I mean, it is a true collaborative effort across all school districts. Um, and, and you know, students aren't bound by the area that they live in, in terms of what they can experience from an education perspective. And so I think you have to invest in that. And if I don't know any other way than, than the way that I've done it. You know, Carrie, and, and um, listening to you talk about the programs and the initiatives, uh, it, it seems in some cases uh, we need to do a better job of telling the work-based learning story, you know, hashtag understatement, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, you know, whether it's uh, awareness campaign to employers or, um, you know, building bridges to, to schools, like what what can we do to kind of move this forward and, and move, you know, increase the brand here, raise the awareness? I think, I, I mean, just from the, the Biz Voice magazine article that was published, um, the number of people who have reached out to me that are interested in learning more. Um, just by, I mean, that was just a few weeks ago. And 
I, I think that we have to do this. We have to talk. We have to talk about it. We have to, um, you know, really think about what parts of the system work and what parts don't. And what are the expectations that we have um, on our accountant to run a marketing campaign? Like we have to really look at those those pieces of the puzzle and figure out um, how, how we can best use systems that are already implemented and and um, build and expand upon those to make them work. Um, we need to have some skin in the game. So like I said, Hamilton County doubled down and they invested in this and they 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 wanted to see a change for students. They wanted to see a change for economic development and, and create that that system of, of workforce development kind of driving um, our community. And so there has to be some skin in the game and and, and collaboration is key. My takeaway from that is we need to get more people reading Biz Voice magazine. There you go. Solve so much, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I I am really surprised at the the number of of people who have reached out and wanted to connect and wanted to learn more based on that article. So I think you're reaching a population, and and I think your population is interested in 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 this kind of um, topic. At least the ones who are contacting me are for sure. It's great to hear. Um, mm -hmm. we're now just a month, um, in, into the general assembly session so far, I know it's still somewhat early, but what has you the most encouraged in terms of work-based learning legislation, which is a pretty big focus of, of legislators this session? It is. I think that I, I did a quick, a quick glance and on the, the bills proposed, I think about 40 of them are engaging with education at, at, at some point or another. Um, which you know it is exciting that you know education is, is a central focus. Um, you know we we've like I've mentioned before laid the foundation. The foundation is there. Um, there are many perceived barriers to work based learning and apprenticeships, um, but they're they're perceived. The barriers have been removed for the most part. We just need to um, give the support to our either our schools or our intermediaries or whatever that might be, we need to support them um, and understanding how to move it forward. And so I, I think that, that that's the exciting part is that we're not, we're not backing off on it. We're, we're continuing to push forward. We're continuing to see uh, the engagement of high school students with employers as a workforce development solution. And I mean, if you think about kind of, across the board the the other issues that are kind of at the at, at the table like the effects of covid on the workforce i mean we can directly tie the effects of covid on our our students and so i mean what we see happening in the workforce and what we see happening in the school systems are are, are mirroring and i think by by continuing to to push forward and, and bring those two systems together um we can we can do some great things. And like I said, the, the barriers have been removed. Our legislators have done a great job in the past, you know, five to seven years of, of removing those barriers. Um, I would like to see us continue to evolve some of the programs that have been established through previous legislation and, and see how they're working. Are they doing what we thought they would do? And, and how can we further support that? Um, because the needs haven't changed. Um, so how can we further support some of those uh, initiatives that we've already invested either time, talent, resources into and, and continue to expand. So, I mean, there's a lot of exciting things that that are coming out um, of some of these bills early on in education. Um, and, and one of my favorite quotes is, is from Thomas Edison, and it's, um, vision without execution is hallucination. And I think that that kind of is my mantra of, I have big ideas and, you know, I need sometimes people on my team to kind of ground me and say, hey, that's a great idea, but that's like a, a two year idea. Let's let's move that out two years. And I think we have the foundation that it, we can put some some really great ideas on on these um, programs that have been established and, and, and continue to execute those, um, you know, at, at a higher level too. And hopefully we come out of this session, we'll have a, um, be able to move forward, move the needle toward finding what that interme intermediary or coordinator may look like on a broader scale, um, mm -hmm. some of the regions that would be really helpful. Uh, looking at forward to a few years from now, five years from now, uh, what do you want to see from work-based learning in the state and maybe even more long-term? So this is one that I'm I'm trying to be really careful with um, <laughs> because this, uh, this, again, this is super passion. Um, you know, this is something I'm, I'm really passionate about. 
And um, really what I, what I would like to see is that um, we don't continue to place expectations on our school systems without the support. And uh, you know, that, that the support can look different, but again, we can't, we can't expect our counselors who have a caseload of 500 students to be able to be a career coach as well. We can't expect our teachers who've never been trained in understanding the connection between English and language arts and workforce development to start implementing and integrating um, employers coming in and talking about technical writing. We have to support the the integration of the two. And so, you know, in the next five years, I would I would love to see that that you know there is a model of of career and technical education and 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 with embedded work based learning um, that works. Uh, we we've as a state as a as a country have have kind of reveled at the uh, European models of vocational educational training um, and and those models don't necessarily work in America because the labor systems are different, the government systems are different, the educational systems are different. And so we have to figure out what works for us uh, with the goal ultimately of being able to uh, to to address some of these workforce and education crises we have. Um, so I have I have a lot of interest in in looking at how our, our PK-12 educational system is is designed, if it's counterproductive uh, in formal education and training to what we're expecting teachers to do, then we need to look at that that model and, and, and update how we're training teachers. Um, I, I want to see how we can address issues in, in curriculum misalignment, where we're teaching kids out of date information or out of date material or, or something that's not relevant to, to uh, local industry needs. Um, Understanding uh, career counseling pitfalls, you know, as a former as a former school counselor, um, I had three credits out of sixty of my master's degree um, in career counseling, and so our school counselors who are our front line of of count of, of you know front line talking to students and parents about careers had three credits, and that's not mandatory. So, out of the twelve institutions in our state, eight of them require three credits to be in career counseling. Um, so we're under preparing our, our front line to be able to, to talk to parents and students about this. And so if we're putting a lot of emphasis on what education can do differently, we've got to better prepare them. We've got to give them the tools to be able to do that. Um, from a, you know, a, a grand perspective, you know, equitable access to these opportunities is, is essential. Um, you know, it, it, it needs to be expanded to all corners of the state that kids have access. And when you build programs that are foundational in um, Department of Education coursework, it can be replicated. It's just making those relationships. Last question. What do you want to leave employers with about work-based learning and where they could start? You know, I think that, again, there's this perception that work-based learning is, is like the elusive unicorn. I, it, it's, it's messy. I don't want to get involved with it. Um, and you know, they're already doing this with adults. They're already skilling up their adults. They're already finding, uh, you know, internal employees that would like to move into other positions. And they're figuring out how to, to train those individuals uh, for that next step in their career. They're bringing in individuals who may not have training and training them to do a job. So that they're already doing these things. Um, if they can rely on the school districts and the school systems to do some of that training on the front end and then have that be a, a pipeline to them, then it takes a little bit of the pressure off. And so where, where you start, I, I, I mean, if I were sitting down with a company and, uh, you know, helping them determine kind of what, what, what do we do next? Um, I would say, well, first, figure out if you want this work-based learning experience to be a social responsibility or if you want it to be a talent retention initiative. So what's your goal? If you want it to be a social responsibility, that's a much easier lift and that's a, a probably a lower ROI on, on your end. But if you want this to be a, a, a pipeline um, solution, then we need to identify that and then address the long-term needs. What are the long-term needs? What, what, what are the, you know, the projection of of jobs and then when you can come together with a skill set of what you're looking for now we integrate 
the education and, and labor market together. And um, if a, an employer came to me with, these are the skills that I want for, our, you know, position ABC, we can work on that and, and get a student connected with that employer um, with either a goal to get those skills together with the education um, at, at the, the K-12 level and um, the on-the-job training at the uh, at the employer, or uh, figure out what what model works best. But they already do this with with individuals that they onboard. Um, but it's it's just kind of figuring out how we can replicate that into a, a K twelve system and funnel it down and use the parameters um, through the Department of Education to to make sure that um, students are getting the education training that they need and employers are getting uh, those individuals skilled correctly. And getting started is that sort of the big, a lot of times the big hurdle. And then yeah. you can see right. what the return on investment investment really is. Well, right. Carrie, thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. It was a great conversation. Thank you. In Chamber is presented by the Talent Resource Navigator. The February issue of Biz Voice Magazine is our annual focus on education and the workforce. Read all the stories at bizvoicemagazine.com. As always, thank you for listening.